Father, we just love you so much and thank you for this time that we can play together. We thank you that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, temperance, meekness. And we thank you, God, for your presence in this room. We thank you, Father, that we haven't come to hear a man, never going to go to church to hear a man. We're coming to church to hear from you, the teacher of the church, your Holy Spirit. Welcome. Teach us, build us, edify us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us. Motivate us to be all that the Father desires us to be, all that the Son paid the price for us to be, and all that you empower us to be. That's what we want. We want to live our lives like that. And we ask you to touch us and strengthen us, encourage us tonight, get there and do what you would have us to do. And we give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor. Now, Lord, we do not at this church want you just to bless us. We want you to bless all the churches that are preaching and teaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're our brothers. We love them, Father. They may not do it like we do it. They may not meet like we meet. They may not have what we have. They may do things completely different. That's your business. Our business is to bless our brothers and sisters. And we thank you for church growth for them as well as us. And church growth in, around the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. And we'll give you the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody say amen. amen. Go with me to Matthew, the 10th chapter. I love the profound words of Jesus because when Jesus says something, he doesn't just say something. I mean, I said this before to you, but I'll say it again because it's worth listening to. Found in the words are more words that are not being said. I think Jesus oftentimes is saying something more by not saying something than he is by saying something. And that's why when you read the word of God real fast and you kind of like blitz your way through, I'll get through this chapter this night and I'll get through this chapter tomorrow, this chapter the next. That's all fine and wonderful if you can do that. But it's really fun to stop, meditate, and think about what the word of God is saying. And when you get into Matthew, that Matthew is like... Pfft, Amazing, because he really works with his disciples in the wonderful text of Matthew. And you really want to know that you're a disciple of God. If you're saved, born of the Spirit of God, if you're blood washed, headed for heaven, guess what? May I say something to you? There is, no, there's, there is a calling on your life to do something with the remainder of your life. Or God would have taken you out of here and just taken you to heaven, but he didn't. He left you here. And if you don't know what to do, and that's where most Christians are that are in American churches, they don't know what to do. So they just follow rituals and ceremonies and traditions of men because they don't know what to do. So if you don't know what to do, here's what happens. You don't do anything. Then you find yourself getting incredibly bored and you say to yourself, what do I need church for? And you end up not going to church and that's a shame. Every time you come to church, I'll be in an encounter with God because God wants to speak something in your heart. Listen to this. That'll help build and encourage your heart so that you can face tomorrow the way he would have you face tomorrow. Do what he'd have you to do so that you can get blessed. God is already blessed. He's not trying to get blessed. Let me say it again. God is already blessed. He's not trying to get blessed. He doesn't need your worship and he doesn't need my worship. We need to worship him. When we worship him, we get free. Are you following me? And so what happens is a lot of times we think God needs us. Can I tell you something? It's, it's, it's completely different. We need God. God needs us so much that he goes along the face of the earth, grabs a bunch of dust, breathes life in it and says that's human. Oh yeah, he needs us. Can I tell you something? He's far beyond anything you and I could ever imagine. It's just amazing. And so what we do is we need him. The more you get of him, the more personal relationship you have with him. The, listen to this, listen, listen, listen. The more you understand his ways instead of just your ways are the ways of the politicians or the ways of the government or the ways of your education. The more you understand his ways, the more you can see how you're to live out your life. The more you live out your life his way, his will, his want, more you get blessed. Now, what does God want? He wants you blessed. Why? Because he wants you to be a witness to a lost and dying world. 
that isn't going to make it. I mean, you ever stop and see some of these movie stars? They got so many millions of dollars. They got people all over them. They've got all the attention you could possibly think of. They've got fortune and fame and everything. And what do they do? They kill themselves. And it's been going on since I was a childhood. That's not new just recently in this last two generations. They've been killing themselves for years. Why? Because when you have fortune and fame and have all the recognition, approval, and acceptance of man, but you don't have God, you are empty and you don't know where to go. And you die. You want to die. But when you have God, you want to live because there's a purpose, a destiny, a plan for your life. Come on, somebody. Give me an amen. And so some of the nights we gather together here just to get the word of God. And I can't think of a, a, a more fun way to do it than to look at the words of Jesus. But let me just tell you something. They're not easy words. Now, as I take you to the 10th chapter of Matthew, I should probably start in the very first. I actually should start at the end of the ninth chapter. So let me just set it up for you so that you can understand what's going on. Because we're going to go not only to what Jesus is telling his disciples, because this is the first missionary journey there's ever been. This is when he commissions them to go do something, you know? And he tells them how to do it and when to do it and why to do it and where to do it. Tells them what to do. Man, it's really kind of cool. God says everything to them. Tells them what to expect, what not to expect, what to look for, what not to look for. It's kind of, he's sending them on this first missionary journey in the Bible. This is it. And, but how he got there started back in chapter number nine when he was talking to the woman at the well and all of a sudden they started coming out of Samaria and he looks at his disciples and he says, look, the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. And then he says, let's pray for the laborers, that there be more laborers. The last verse, verse number nine. And then they become the answer to their own prayers. (laughs) You gotta watch what you pray for. You know, I, I'm saying, God, this true story. I'm in Lake Arrowhead. I'm in a home with mama and the kids are little. And um, so I'm looking over the valley, you know, we're in Lake Arrowhead. It's beautiful, you know, blue birds and, and squirrels and smell of fragrance and pine trees. And oh, man, it's totally cool. And we start looking over the valley and we start praying for the valley. We say, God. You need to send a real church to that valley. There hadn't been one built in 43 years. You need a real church. Someone will say it like it is, cut the bull. Just stop playing games. You know, get rid of all the smoke and incense and stuff and let's talk about Jesus. I need you to do that, God. I want you to do that, Debbie, would you be in prayer? Lord, that, there, there's jewel, it's like a jewel box down there. You, 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 we'd stop and pray over the rim. Where are the answers to the prayer? And it's like, hey, wait a minute, I want you to send somebody else to San Bernardino. I wanted to go to Santa Barbara. I, I want to go to Honolulu, Maui, anything but San Bernardino. Oh, but thank God we came to San Bernardino and it had been good. Now, here's my point. They became the answer to their prayers. And oftentimes God will set you up by your prayers. And that's not bad. That's a good thing. Then he sends them out, and I, you know, the first number of verses are amazing. All his disciples tells them what to do, but I, instead of going to the first verse, which I probably should have done, I was just so impressed by the verse number 16 through 28. I want to read it to you, then I'm going to come back and explain every bit of it all at one time if I can. It's so important for us. Matthew, the 10th chapter, verse number 16. He says, behold, now he's talking to his disciples, sending them out, okay? He says, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of, the, of wolves. And therefore be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Be aware of, beware, but beware of men. For they will deliver you up to counsel and scourge you in their synagogues. Verse, if you will, verse number 18. You will be brought before the governors and kings for my sake as a testimony unto the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about what you should speak, for I have given you in, in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you for it is not you who speaks, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. 
Now brother will deliver a brother to death and father, his child and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. You don't talk about something hard. I don't know if you, we'll cover that in just a minute. Verse 22, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. Verse 23, and when the persecute you in the city, flee to another. For surely I say unto you, we'll have done through the cities of Israel before the son of man comes. Verse 24, a disciple is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like the teacher and a servant like the master. If they have called the master uh, of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those who are his household? That's you and me. Therefore, do not fear them for There is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak it in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach it from the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. These words are like nuts. And I think you ought to just all go home right now. Because this is really words that are shake up your thinking. I'm telling you now that there's no way in the world that you can live a lukewarm, casual, just get by life as a Christian and expect to be pleasing to God. He talks to his disciples. You say, that's the disciples. Can I tell you something? It's been preserved for thousands of years, not so that you can learn a story. It's been preserved for thousands of years so you and I can find out what the heck it is that God wants for us. And what does he expect for us? But it only comes to those that have an incredible commitment. And you might say, well, pastor, that's just really radical. Can I tell you something? When you start to read your Bible from the very beginning to the end, man, it is filled with radical people. In fact, we're in Hebrews 11 chapter. They're all radical. They didn't get into Hebrews 11 chapter, the hall of faith, unless they were radical. A lot of things we're going to talk about tonight, and I don't know how far we'll get, but you know, let's just start. Is that okay? Verse number 16, I love this, behold. I mean, we could stop right there and go for a week. How many people, the word behold is not just a word that's put there because it's some old English word. Behold, we don't talk that way. Hey, behold. You know, we don't even speak those kind of words. But here's what it really means. Stop, look, listen, see what's going on. It's very important. That's what the word behold means. And how many of us go through life when it comes to God, we really don't stop, look and listen and see what's going on around us. We just take it for granted. And here God says something, I want you to see something. I want you to know something. I want you to stop and recognize what's taking place. Just one word changes your whole life. Some of you just come into the church and not a lot of you, but some of you are just just as mentally and as as dead as you could possibly be, you're in the wrong church, man. Unless you were gonna plan on making some changes, this place is fired up going for Jesus. It's the way it's gonna be, always has been, and it's gonna get even more so. And so the point being, this word behold fits every one of us. It ought to be something that we stop, look, see, listen, hear. We evaluate what's going on. You've got to see this. Don't miss it. It's what the word behold means. Just one word. And he says, I send you out. And don't you know that God wants to send every one of us out somewhere? It might be just to your own family, but I doubt that. But it's certainly going to be at that workplace or those relatives. I know I had lots of relatives that need to be saved. Anybody besides me had those kind of relatives around? You know, they were either going to get saved or I'm going to kill them. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about. I mean, they're half in, half out, little up, little down. You know, they're more involved in the things of the world than they are. I, I got tons of them. I remember those family times when we gathered together. He says, I send you out. And he says, I send you out as a sheep. Now, he's not mixing words. He's saying something to all of us. Here's kind of the interesting thing about it. 
A sheep is, a, is, a, is an animal on the earth that has no defensive weapons and no offensive weapons. Do you understand that? He has no teeth to bite. He has no claws <clears throat> to scratch or tear up. He doesn't have an armor of skin. He doesn't have uh, the brains or the cunning enough or the craftiness to hunt and stalk his prey. He's prop. I don't want to say this because I don't mean to be offensive. Probably one of the dumbest animals on the planet. And he equates this type of a non-aggressive, absolutely non-defensive, non, if you will, uh, animal to us. And he says, I call you and send you out as sheep would be good enough. But then he warns them. And he's warning us tonight, every single one of us. He says, I send you out somewhere. You know, he didn't send us out to a party. He didn't send us out to Maui. He didn't send us to Beverly Hills. Didn't send us to Santa Barbara. Somehow, some way, you and I got here. And this is where God would have us to be and where God wants to do something. Because if God can do something in San Bernardino, God can do something anywhere in the world. And he comes along and says, I sent you out a sheep in the midst of, didn't say rams, didn't say, you know, he says wolves, wolves. The world out there wants to eat you up. And all the stuff that's coming against religion, take take the word religion by itself. And you know, right now there's a rise against religion because of some of the activities of one facet of the religious world that's killing other people right now. And that's gonna backfire to all religions. Always has. Put us all in one lump. And the world hates us. And they're wolves, and wolves eat, and wolves destroy, and wolves are cunning, and wolves are crafty, and wolves are selfish, and wolves don't care about. And you and I need to be smart enough to realize that we are a defenseless animal, ah, without God. But with God, mm, back off, dude. (laughs) And that's what it all comes down to. And then he says, therefore, because I just said that to you, how you are. He says, therefore, he says, he be be wise as serpents, harmless stuff. Wise, he says, and harmless. I had, I, I, I think one of the things that we must see here that's so totally cool is these words and what they really mean. Wise and harmless really translate wise to confident and harmless, if you will, to dependent. And you ought to just write that above the words in your Bible. I'm calling you to be wise, which is, if you will, uh, a really important word because here's this word that describes us as a people who are confident. When I'm confident in who I am in Christ Jesus and him in me, then all of a sudden I now start to operate in his wisdom and not my own wisdom. If I'm confident in myself or confident in my education, confident in who I am or where I live or how much money I have in the bank, then all of a sudden I start operating in a different kind of a confidence. The wisdom that he's talking about, be wise, is a wisdom that only comes from God. There's two kinds of wisdom. There's wisdom of the world. That means you do things the world's way, your, maybe your family's way, or the, what economics tell you, or what social systems tell you, or you're going to do things God's way. Sometimes, and almost all the time, it's contrary to the way. So there's this wisdom that he's talking about. And when you have a confidence in that wisdom, oh my goodness. And then you have a dependency. Let's see the word harmless. Harmless means I don't need to fight my own battles. And I love this harmless as a dove. I've said it for years and years and years. None of us have ever seen an attack dove. (laughs) You know, maybe there's a hawk or something like that, you know, but not a dove. You know, they're not going to come along and swoop at you in any of that stuff. So he says something harmless as a dove, which is really something, I don't have to fight my own battles. You know, when Jesus made a statement, and it was a real statement that he made, it's one of the statements I hate the most. Can I tell you one of the worst statements I ever heard in my life that Jesus may not have the most difficult time with? 
Can I tell you which, which, I mean, I hate this statement. And I can tell you honestly today that I hate this statement. And here's the statement Jesus makes. Listen to this. Tell me how harmless this is. When someone hits you on the cheek, turn the right cheek. I said to God, God, before I was a Christian, I was made a man. And you hit me in the cheek, I'm going to take out your cheeks. And, and it's just like this, you know, I don't know if I could do that anymore because of my age. I don't even know if I could make a fist, but I could sure slap hard. <laughs> or maybe give you a judo chop or something, you know. But the point I'm trying to make to all of us is harmless means God fights the battle for you. You've got to remember that. You're facing a situation tonight and you're difficult and you don't know how it's going to come to pass. Can I tell you, welcome to the ministry. Welcome to Christianity 101. You, when you don't know how something's coming to pass, how it's going to take place, can I tell you something? It doesn't mean get up and do it yourself. It means wait for God to come along and fight your battles for you. He's going to do it for you. And sometimes what we try to do is do everything ourselves and get so frustrated with God because nothing works when in fact he's just saying, why don't you just be as harmless as a dove? It's kind of cool that he's saying this to these guys because they're obviously going to be confronted with some problems as you read these verses as they go on. Let's read the next verse, verse number 17. But beware of men <clears throat> for they'll deliver you up for, to the council and scourge you for their synagogues. You will be brought before the governors and the kings for my sake as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. In other words, God says, you got problems coming your way. Isn't this interesting? And your problems have an opportunity to be a witness to those that are lost. That's what he just said. And I want to say, God, I don't want the problems and I don't want it to be that kind of a witness. I don't mind just being a witness, but I don't want to be a witness to somebody when I've got problems. But how you handle the problems makes the witness. Is anybody listening? I was talking to someone the other day. You know, uh, after all of these years being a theologian, studying the word of God, I mean, I can't even tell you how much. And it's my life. I know something. God sees death differently than we do. We fall apart at death. I believe God rejoices at death. And the reason for that is because his eternal kingdom is so great and so vast that staying here in this fallen, corrupt, filthy, dirty world is like, get me out of here. And I wouldn't be surprised. I don't, have, I don't have scripture on this. I'm just telling you what I'm thinking. This is my own personal thought here. So don't go saying I'm saying this as scripture. I would not be surprised if someday we get to heaven and find out that every Christian that ever went before God, every Christian you ever know that died, everyone young and old alike, were asked by God, do you want to go back or do you want to stay? And in the midst of the feeling of fulfillment and completion, in the midst of the feeling of attainment, 99.999 say, I want to stay. What about my family? He says, I'll take care of them. They'll be fine. And they stay. They have graduated into a better place. And what I'm saying is, with that in mind, I can live a harmless life and I can be that witness to a lost and dying world, even in the midst of my own persecution that the world wants to put on me. Is anybody listening? It's so important for us to see because a lot of times we don't see that at all. Did you know that it's so important for us because as I read this in verse number 17, it said, beware of men. Do you remember that? Beware of men. <clears throat> you know, the Bible says that you should not take on another man's debt. You know how many times people have come and said to me, I want you to co-sign for me. If you co-sign, it'd be just everything fine. And I want to, I want to help you. I really want to. But did you know the Bible has stopped me so many times because it gave me real insight. Don't take on another man's debt. And when you take on another man's debt, now you're responsible for his failure or not failure. And therefore it ruins you because you took on another man's debt. And the Bible makes it very clear about that. And notice how it says, beware of men. 
In other words, we need to love men, but he says, don't trust men. And too many times we put our trust in men and men let us down. Listen to the wisdom here. Too many times we put your trust in men and women and they let you down, discouraging you when in fact you are called to love them, but never to put your trust in them. Did you know that? In fact, look at words of Jesus, John, the second chapter, last two verses in the second chapter, verse 24 and 25. But Jesus did not commit himself to them. Speaking of the people, men, listen to this, because he knew all men. <clears throat> but verse 25 is interesting. Now watch this. You know, for people who want to trust in men instead of God, listen to this. And he had no need that anyone should testify of man. He didn't need somebody to come and tell him what it's like with men. Watch. He knew what was in man. He put his trust in the Father. <clears throat> and you and I are to put our trust in the Father, in God, and love men. There's a difference between loving men and trusting men. <laughs> Somebody listen. And he says, beware of men. Verse number, if you will, 19. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. For I'll give it to you in that hour that what you should speak. And verse number 20. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of the father who speaks in you. This is something we've totally missed. How many people that you've ever known in your life said, I just couldn't do that? I'm afraid I don't know enough about God. I wouldn't know what to say. I don't know how to be that person. And we forget that it is God that gives us the power to do the job that we speak. In fact, it is so ridiculous for some pastors I've known over the years to think of themselves as great preachers. It's stupid. They may be great preachers, but it's God that gives them the inspiration and God that gave them the word and God that put them in the side of this thing. This is all about God speaking through us to somebody. And he says, don't worry about that. What are we worried about? In other words, if you're in God, you don't have to worry a bit about your future, not even about what you're going to say, let alone what you're going to do. God's going to make a way for you. And it's tall, called totally trusting God in every area of your life. And sometimes we think, well, you know, the greatest preachers I've ever known are people that are worst communicators I've ever seen. So true. It's like you meet them and, and you expect... I'm, I, 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 and they don't talk. It's like, hi, how are you? And they, they just blew the whole platform up and the church went wild and the greatest thing. And you sit down with them, let's have dinner. We sit down, have dinner together. And they don't talk. They just stare. They're introverted. It is like Superman that went inside of a booth. And he took off his suit from the Daily Planet and put on the Superman suit and shot right through the ceiling. And then he shot back into the phone booth, put back on his suit and walked out. Why? Because God gives you the words. And many times I was telling a pastor, uh, pastor that I was talking to today, call me. And I, and I told him, I said, how many times have you been preaching? And the words that came out of your mouth you never thought about a second before they came out of your mouth. He says, that's my whole life. Wow. You know, we have notes. Dick said, it is a big house, maybe a big family will live there. You have to be over 60 to understand that. But it's the inspiration of God. It's the words, it's God opening the doors and closing the doors. It's God even, did he not do that with Moses? I'll give you the words, dude. I'll give it to you. I can't speak good. Get none of you can. And you're not smart enough either. So God does it all. All you have to do is open your mouth. Is anybody listening? And don't worry. He'll give you the words, but don't trust me. And verse number 21. Do I have time for 21? I do. 
<clears throat> and the, this verse 21 is nuts. Let me just highlight verse 21 by making a statement. In verse number 21, he is saying something to me that's very important to all of us. Watch your commitment level. If you were in a world where verse 21 was taking place, what would you think of God? Let me, let me just ask you that question. I'm going to read verse 21 together. But if you were in a world where before your eyes you see this, and maybe even part of it in your family... What would you think of God yet? He is warning his disciples about the intense persecution that could come. And by the way, can I just say something? I was talking to Baron Gilfillan. You know Dr. Gilfillan? Everybody know Dr. Gilfillan, part of our church? One of the greatest missionary outreaches in the world. Without a doubt, the most effective missionary outreach in the world. Just lost, I think it's in Libya, a, a, a missionary. They cut him in pieces. His eyes, his ears, every part of his body, his skin, before he died. Just right there. And, you know, we live in this world that the worst thing that happens is it's crowded to Disneyland. And that's pretty bad. But here's this world outside. Could it come to us? It could, but we need to be prepared for it. Now watch this. Now brother will deliver a brother to death and a father is you got to be kidding and children will rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to what death. I mean that's a horrible expression from Jesus I thought Jesus always talked nice stuff I thought Jesus was all full of lovey dovey stuff but he's warning those people that are going to follow him. Remember that, you know, you're not worthy if you don't pick up your cross and follow me. He's warning those people. He says, you know, this, this is a time when things could fall apart in your very own life because of who you are in Christ Jesus. Will you fall apart because things around you fall apart? You know, oftentimes the stuff around us determine whether or not we go on with God. You know, God, I'll serve you as long as everything's cool. As soon as there's a little pressure, man, I ain't going back to that church. And that, that just says, and smacks of, don't put your trust in men. You know? I'll serve you as long as this, or as long as this, or it fits with my plans, or, you know, I can live this. Why can't I just live a normal, I, I, I've talked to God about this for 20 years. I talked to God, said, God, I just want to live a normal life. I want to go to work and love you, go to church, raise my kids Christian. He never told me I was going to be a pastor. And I was going to get the snot beat out of me from every dingbat in the world that ever came through church. And here this, you know, sometimes we stop doing what we're doing because of the problems that we're facing. And now he says, check your commitment level. If you don't have a commitment level that's beyond the pain of your feelings, oh, you've got to say that again, Pastor. Oh, okay, I will. Okay, please say it again. I will be happy to. If you don't have a commitment level that goes beyond the pain of your feelings, you haven't got a commitment level that'll sustain you through the problems of the future. Is anybody listening? You want me to say that again? Get the CD. That's the only way you're going to hear that again. But you know what I'm talking about. It's true. And listen to the word of God, if you will, just for a few moments. You know, we need to be wise. In Deuteronomy, the 10th chapter, verse 12 and 13, I'll just pop it up on overhead. Verse 12 says, now Israel, what does the Lord God require of you? <laughs> this is all it. All the time we've been busted at trying to find out what God wants from us. Now he's going to tell us in this like one verse. You've got this big fat Bible in your lap. Oh my, my. Here's one verse tells you the whole thing. Can you imagine such a thing? It's like, what does the Lord God require of you? 
You know how many Christians live their life wondering what it is that God wants from them? Maybe that's you. How many times have you said to God, God, what do you want? I mean, Debbie and I are saying the same thing in our old age right now. What do you want from us, God? Where do you want us to go? What do you want us to do? I'm ready to do anything. <clears throat> God didn't say a thing. Lord, what do you want from us? What do you require of us? But to fear the Lord, number one, that means to respect and reverence him. Listen to this. Walk, see the word to walk means to live out life. How do you live out life? Raise your children, operate your business, love your wife, love your husband. Listen, live out life in all. Not some, not the ones that just fit. See, that's what we do. We'll do the ones that fit when it comes down to it, but we don't do the other ones. We wonder why we're not in it because it says all there. He could have just left the word all out. Would have made me a lot happier. It's like turn your cheek and get slapped. That one didn't make me happy. This one doesn't make me happy either. Can we just write the verse over again and leave the word all out of there? I can do it if the word all isn't in there, but the word all is in there, therefore, ah! I'll live out my life in all of his ways and to love him, verse number, go on, to serve the Lord, your God, with all of your heart, and with, oh, there it is again, all your soul. Verse 13, and to keep the commandments, that's the word of God, not the 10 commandments. Those of you who think the 10 commandments, no, we're past that. Jesus fulfilled all of that. Now it's, the, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my word. He says, and fill and keep his commandments of the Lord and his statutes and, and command you today. And he says these last words, I should have highlighted these last words. See, it says these words, for your good. I don't know if you guys in back have the ability to do that on the fly. I know you're changing everything back there. You may not have the computer ready to do that. But the words for your good is an amazing three words. Because that's everything God wants you to do for him and with him and about him is for your own good. <clears throat> that in itself is like nuts. That says it all right there. It's not for his good. Can I tell you something? He's already good. Is that not true? It's not for his good. It's, it's for your good. And, I, and can I just say something? God loves you so much. It's like he's a parent that really cares about his kids and he wants the best for his kids. Now maybe some of you had lousy parents and I'm sorry about that. But there's nothing better than having a good parent. And God in heaven is your good parent. And he wants the best for you. Maybe your earthly parents didn't give a flip about you, but your one in heaven loves you and wants the best for you. That's why you ought to serve him with all of your heart. And my point being is this, is, you know, we need to watch your commitment level because even when tough times come and things you don't understand happen, and you say, why God? Why God? You, why God? Stop it. Stop saying why God. And say, God, you're a just God. I don't understand it now. I'll talk to you later about it. But I'm still going to keep on serving you no matter what happens. <coughs> you understand how that works? Very important for us. Verse number 22. I like verse 22. Do I have time? I'm quitting. I'm going to only go to verse 22. But it's a good verse. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Did you know he says that a number of times in scripture? Wait a minute. He, look at it, endures, he who endures to the end will be saved. 
In the midst of your problems, in the midst of the pressure, in the midst of misunderstanding, in the midst of, uh, of frustration, in the midst of uh, not being able to calculate why this has happened, is totally and completely in your thinking, contrary to the ways of God, and you want to question God, you don't. But here he comes along and says, don't let any of those pressures from the outside keep you away from who he is on the inside. And he says, because he that endures, he endures what? The problems, trials, tribulations, and pressures of life that come when you endure them to the end there's a reward you'll be saved now can I just ask you a question what if you don't <laughs> now I don't, I, don't, I, don't to, I don't want to screw up your theology or your thinking but I do want to challenge you today all through scripture including the book of Revelation. He that endures to the end. What if I don't endure? I don't know. And you can yell the big word at me, grace. I hope so, but don't forget, you can frustrate grace and you can eliminate grace and you can also uh, 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 cause grace to, to not operate. You can do a lot of things to hinder the grace that God's given you to get you to heaven, maybe not enduring. To, I don't know, I'm not there. I'm just knowing this. Here's the way I want to live my life. I want to endure to the end. And you say, Pastor, that's because you're really old and the end is coming soon. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I wanted that ever since I was a kid. I want to endure. I don't care what it takes. I'm passing from this place to a better place. And I can hardly wait. I, I tell you the truth. I don't even want to stay here. I'm staying here because I feel that God has something for me. And so therefore, I'm staying. But I'm here to tell you the truth. The truth is... He that endures to the end. I'm not going to play that game with God and challenge him. I'm just going to endure to the end. How about you? Enough tonight. Enough, enough, enough. Next time we get together on Wednesday night, we'll continue. In, 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 uh, let me make a note that I stopped in verse 10. I mean, verse uh, 22. Verse 22. I will endure to the end of this message. If you got something from God, give the Lord a great big praise. Come on. <laughs> my mother, who was very old, she used, a lot of you used, remember my mom, she died at 96, and she was part of this church. Every time I ever got in the pulpit area, she says, people like you better when you preach short. <laughs> and then Debbie, every time I go to church, she says, I'm not going to be there, so don't go rambling on. Just get to it and do a 20-minute message. I want you to know something. I don't listen to anybody. I just feel like I hear God tell me what to speak for somebody is happening. That's the way it is. Love you guys a whole lot. Let's make sure everybody's all right with God before you go. We had like tons of people saved this weekend. Neat thing about the rock, you come to the rock, get saved. You can bring people that are going to hear an altar call. And you're going to have to hear this. And you may have heard it over the years. It doesn't change much every time we're together because why change what works? Come on, guys, like 350 salvations this weekend. You don't even know the most churches in America don't even have that many people in church. That's like five times more people than people in church for the average church in America. So let's just see if anybody tonight needs to get right with God. Is that okay? Look, we talked about commitment levels. Some of you have head knowledge about who God is, but you're not going to make it to heaven with head knowledge. I already know you know who Jesus is. I already know you know who, what about Christmas and born in the manger. I already know you know about Easter. Hey, I already know that. You wouldn't be here if you didn't know about Jesus. Can I tell you something? Because you have Jesus and knowledge of Jesus in your head doesn't make you a Christian. Did you know that? That's the shocking part about it. Somebody needs to love you enough to tell you the truth. And I want to ask you a question tonight. And I want you to stop and answer the question in your heart. Nobody. Everybody say Nobody. Yeah, everybody say nobody. Nobody. <laughs> nobody will know but you and God. Here's the question. You're to walk out of this place, head to your car, heart stopped. And you died. Would you go to heaven? Or would you go to hell? If you died in the next few minutes, would you go to heaven? Or would you go to hell? <clears throat> That's like, oh, okay, I don't know. I, I hope I go to heaven, some of you. 
Somebody said, I think I'll go to heaven. I'm pretty good. I should make it. Can I tell you something? None of those answers. You can't hope your way in heaven. It's not in the Bible. You, you, you can't get to heaven because you think, you know, positive thinkers get to go to heaven. You're not going to make it. You, you know, you can't get to heaven because you think you're good enough to make it to heaven. That's not how you get to heaven. Listen to this. Listen, listen, listen. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man goes to the Father except by me. In other words, you can't get to heaven your way, my way, or some well-meaning church committee's way. The only way you get to heaven is Jesus' way. And he makes it very clear in John 3rd chapter, he says it like this. You must be born again. You must be born again. Now, most people hear the words born again, and they go freak out. You know, because television and movies have trained us to hate born again people because they're weirdos, freakos, religious fanatics, and goofballs. But can I tell you something? That is not what Jesus is talking about. And I'm not talking about that either. Born again means something from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Most people in 10 American churches don't know this, but let me tell you what it means. Is that okay? So that you can understand when Jesus says you must be born again. Here's what it means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. It means you've given God all of your heart, given God all of your life. That's what we just read in Deuteronomy. All, all, all your heart and all your life. This is not a half in, half out relationship. This is not a a relationship with God that is, you know, you're you're lukewarm at. You're not going to make it. You know, this is not just a a mental commitment to God, but a heart is far from the things of God. You know, listen to what Jesus said. It's all or nothing. And I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, book of Revelation. Listen to what the Bible says. Book of Revelation says these words. Jesus is speaking. He says, I'm coming again. And when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Did you understand what Jesus just said? I thought Jesus said always nice things. That's a rude, crude statement. I'll vomit you from my mouth. Because if he finds you lukewarm, he will vomit you. He says, either be hot or cold, but don't try to be lukewarm and try to get in. You won't make it. I'll vomit you from my body. Wow. Wow. What did he just say? Lukewarm people are not going to make it. Can I just, for the sake of it, define for all of you that are out there what a lukewarm person is? Little in, little out. Little up, little down. Token prayer. Occasional church attendance, you know. But you're not against God. No, no, you're not against God, but you're not wholehearted. Remember Deuteronomy, you just read it. Wholehearted for God. That's lukewarm. And somebody, please stop playing games with you and love you enough to tell you the truth. Respect you enough to tell you exactly what the Bible says instead of throwing smoke and incense all over you. Tonight, here you are in the house of God. And I've told you the truth about everything. And I want you to know something tonight. Some of you, if you don't get right with God, you're not going to make it because you've been lukewarm. Little in, little out, little up, little down, token prayer, occasional church attendance. And now it's time to make the commitment of all of your heart and all of your life. I don't care what your relatives say. I don't care what your friends say. I don't care what your schoolmates or workers tell you. That's what it's going to take is all of your heart and all of your life. And no one can do that but you. Did you know that? You can't make somebody do it. I remember one wife brought her husband who'd been cheating. She caught him. You know, she brought him to church. She said, all the way I'll get married and stay married to you. You go to church, get saved. You can get saved in my church. He comes and gets saved, supposedly, raises his hand. She nudges, okay, this time you put your hand up. Can I tell you something? He's not saved anymore than a man in the moon. It's got to come from your heart. I want this. I'm believing to this. I'm making a commitment to this of all of my heart. I'm going to live the rest of my life to the best of my ability with God on the inside, for God, with God. And I don't even know how to do that, you might say to yourself. But guess what? A great church like this will teach you how to do that. And with great friends, will encourage you to keep on going during tough times. That's what The Rock makes so special and so great about it. But we're here for you. But you have to make the commitment of giving God all of your heart in all of your life. I can't do it for you. So you say to me, well, Pastor Jim, who, how do I do this? How do I, how do I give God all my heart? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In other words, 
If you're going to deny me, I'm not going to stand up for you. But if you do confess me, I will confess you as mine before the Father. Wow, Jesus will come in. Someday you'll stand before God. Jesus will come in and say, he belongs to me, Father. Best words you will ever hear. Not go for me, or worker of iniquity, I know you not. Those are the worst words you'll ever hear. So tonight, this is a serious moment for all of you that are here. Some of you are walking in and out, little in, little out. Some of you are there, not there. Some of you are really checking yourself out right now. Congratulations. But let's get right by God. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'm a man. He says, I'll confess you before my father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. I'll count to three in a moment. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll go bang. When you hear that sound, my hand's popping together. You put your hand up. How simple is that? You do it every day. You sleep sometimes at night with your hand up. It's as easy as thing going. It's not difficult, but you're making a statement by raising your hand. I'm going to see it. Well, I'll go one, two, three, bang, your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up and then you can put it right back down. Why? Because that's what Jesus said. If you confess me before a man, I'm a man, I'll see it. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God? Listen to me, listen, listen, listen. If you've been running from God instead of to God, you know who you are. You're running more from him than to him. Get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your heart, you know whether you've done that or not. Listen, just because you pray to prayer, Billy Graham crusade or a harvest crusade, doesn't mean you've given him all of your heart. It's not in the prayer. God watches the heart to see if the prayer is real. So tonight you got to give him all of your heart. And if you haven't done it, you're in a safe place to do that. If you haven't given him all of your life, get ready to put your hand up. You know, if you're still living for yourself instead of wanting to live for him. And my goodness sake, get ready to get your hand up. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're just not sure, I'm not sure if I'll make it or not make it, I hope I would, then psh, come on, don't be dumb. You say, Pastor, if I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yep, you will. Horribly embarrassed. I'm going to come down there with your hand up and hit you in the head with a Bible. No, I'm not going to pay any attention to you at all. I'm just going to quickly count you. That's it. Put your hand right back down. As simple as that. Come on. You might be embarrassed, but isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? Let me tell you something. You get in hell, you'd lose anything to get out of hell. Both your hands, arms, and your underwear and a flagpole just to get out of hell. But here in a safe place, you just get your hand up and put it right back down. I'll see it. And then we'll pray together guess what and my goodness you're going to head for heaven and you're going to deny your presence in hell your call I've done my job I'm finished Ooh, am I finished I'm counting to three get ready to pop your hand up one two three let me see your hands 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 Thank you, there's one. You're pointing to somebody. There's one. Thank you, there's two. There's three. Thank you, there's four. There's five. There's six. God, you scared me for a second. My goodness, you just needed someone to prime the pump. There's six. Thank God. Anybody else? Real quick, you know you need to get your hand. There's seven. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's six or seven wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? Hurry, you don't want to miss this. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? How simple is it? Anybody else? Come on, you want to be included in that prayer? You're going to need to raise your hand up. Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for five or six wise people. Here's what I want you to do. All of you that raised your hand, and man, I need you all to respond because there's such a small amount. But I'm not disappointed because there's 350 people this last weekend. So my goodness, I didn't, you know, I didn't know there would be anybody here today. So guess what? All five or six, you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Anybody that didn't raise your hand, you little rascal, but you know you should have, you can come too. Just get your coat. Nudge your neighbor right now. Everybody nudge your neighbor and say, come on, I'll go with you. Okay, say, come on, I'll go with you if you need to go. Debbie always does that to me. It's like, you got to be kidding, Debbie. I'm the pastor. And uh, she's always saying, I'll go with you. And uh, so I don't know if she thinks I'm not saying. No, anyway, uh, here's what we want you to do. All five or six or seven or eight of you are going to give God all of your heart and all of your life. I want you to get your stuff, get in the aisle, meet me right here, and we'll pray together. Everybody, let's stand and welcome them. Nobody leave while they come. You just come right now. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. I surrender.
Lord, come and give me a hand as they come. happen to know there's a dozen more of you that should have come. How do I know that? If God can speak to me about what to say, he can speak to me about you. I want you, dozen, come back to the rock and make that profession of your faith. Come and walk the aisles for Jesus. Come and give God all of your heart. You don't have to do it tonight if you feel uncomfortable, but we love you a lot. Don't run from it. Just make, listen, there's an old saying, it's kind of a dumb statement. He that hangs around the mud hole will slide in. Come on, hang around this good mud hole here. You're going to slide right on into Jesus, and that's going to be good. All of you in front, so cool, so cool, good. Okay, this is Pastor Joel right over here. Pastor Joel is a really good guy. No weird stuff goes on, I promise you. No, no, no goofy stuff. He's just going to lead you in a prayer, give you some free stuff. The F word at our church is free. That's San Bernardino. It's free. It's a free stuff to read about what to do next. It's really kind of cool. Is that okay? And then he'll introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainer. Some of the wonderful people are right behind you right now. They're friends in the future. They'll tell you what to do. Just real quick, people you came with will wait for you. Make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel right over there, and he'll lead you in the prayer. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.